All right, well, if you're anything like me, a little bit later this afternoon, you are going to find yourself firmly ensconced in front of the television, hopefully on an easy chair or, in my case, a couch. And you will have a couple of things at hand. You will have the remote control, so you can switch back and forth to the other game. Uh, you will be able to have a bowl of chips and dip, and uh, you will have a pillow that's a favorite pillow. And uh, we will watch the Bears play those who shall not be named. And um, that other place. And um, ushers, ushers. <laughs> Problem is we got some Green Bay fans or ushers, so I don't know what they do. <laughs> Here's what's going to happen. By the third or fourth quarter, I'm not only going to have a chance to cheer for the good plays, I am going to be an expert, and I'm going to be able to tell Jay Cutler why he shouldn't have held that pass that long and take the sack. I'm going to have exactly the reason why Alshon Jeffrey should have broke off that pattern a little quicker so that he could have gotten that pass out to the flats. And for sure, I'm going to be the one to say, Jared Allen, if you would have taken the inside track, you would have sacked Aaron Rodgers today. Because when it comes to football and me sitting on the couch, I'm an expert. In fact, I'm a critic. But when there's a 320-pound linebacker, or I guess that's too big for a linebacker, 320-pound lineman towering over me, ready to collapse my entire life if I don't get rid of the ball, I would freeze or run like a little girl away from that. It's easy to be a critic when you're on the couch. Uh, that's very true when it comes to serving in the church as well. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we're in our third week in our study of the imperfect church. It's a study of the book of 2 Corinthians. Let me be very upfront with you that normally when I preach, I'm very concerned to cast as wide a net as possible. In other words, I want as many people uh, sitting here in the room to benefit from what I'm saying. I want, I want it to apply very broadly. But today, because the text does this, and we're going to be beholden to the text... I'm going to talk to a narrow range of people in this congregation. I'm going to do that without apology because that's where the uh, scriptures in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 takes us. Uh, the next several weeks, as a matter of fact, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 4, 5, uh, 6, and 7 is the most extensive discussion of the topic of how to serve Jesus Christ effectively that's in the entire New Testament. And so what we're going to do is take our time today introducing this topic because, listen, it's easy to critic when you're not in the game. I want to talk to those of you who are in the game, that is, you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ through the outreach ministry of this church. So I think one of the ways to sort of focus my attention uh, about uh, who it is I'm speaking with is if you serve here, and by that I mean uh, whoever did it, I don't know, whoever set up the chairs at 6.30 this morning, or they held a door for you when you came in, or they did the bulletin, or they take their paycheck from this uh, church, or they are ushers or greeters, or they are deacons, or they are elders, or they are small group leaders, they are caring for the children, or they are with the nursery, or they clean the building, or any way you serve. Uh, would you stand up for a minute? Don't be shy, stand up. Okay? Anybody? Thank you, Sonnet. I know you serve. Let's keep standing, Sonnet. Come on, girl. I want to talk to you this morning. And I want to say three things to you. Three things are from the text, right from out of 2 Corinthians 3. And uh, here are the three things I'm going to say to us, because I also do this. Uh, I'm going to say, first of all, this is an impossible task. Just three statements about uh, this text. This is an impossible task. This is the best work in the world. And the third thing is, this is how to do the impossible. Recognize what you are attempting to do, what I attempt to do, is impossible work. We're called to do that which we cannot do. How do you change the heart of an individual? How do you take someone from the kingdom of darkness and place them in the kingdom of light? The reality is, it's impossible. But, Paul will argue, it's the best work in the world. When we recognize exactly what it is God has called us to do, when we recognize the treasure we have that we're sharing with others, there's nothing in the world we'd rather be doing. And then we're going to spend about the last five to ten minutes of our time this morning uh, talking about some specifics. Uh, this is how we do the impossible. Because unless, unless I miss my guess, some of you who are standing right now, even though you give of your time and you're not compensated for it, at least not in this life, 
Even though you put some of your best effort into this ministry, you are at times misunderstood. There are times people deeply disappoint and sometimes hurt you. You have a rising frustration at times with the way people do or do not uh, follow through on uh, the service you provide for them. You are misunderstood, you are disappointed, and if you are like me, there are times you feel extremely ill-prepared or incompetent for this ministry. You are who I'm, uh, whom I'm addressing today. So with that in mind, go ahead and sit down. Those who are still sitting, I'll have something to say to you about uh, the third point of the message, so you can um, listen in until then, but I'll be speaking directly to uh, you at that point. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul is, well, 2 Corinthians is a letter written out of a lot of heartbreak. Paul's dealing with a church that he loved. He founded the church at Corinth. He wrote more to that church than any other church recorded in the New Testament. And yet, by the time he gets to 2 Corinthians, it's five years after the church was founded, and the church is in all kinds of trouble and turmoil. And unfortunately, the turmoil had to do kind of with Paul. Questions had been asked by some who were new to the church after Paul had left. And the questions mostly had to do with, if Paul is such a great pastor, why isn't he here? If Paul is so blessed by God to share the gospel, why is his life so hard? He's been in jail. He's been in prison. He's been driven out of multiple towns. It seems like every church that he founds, there's all kinds of doctrinal trouble or lifestyle error there. If he's such a great servant of God, why is his life so hard? And then it got even more personal. If he's so good with the message, why is he not a very good public speaker? Those questions were being asked, publicly knocked around. Paul will address that. Oh, you're very unimpressive, Paul, when you come and talk to us. And all those issues began to rise. And Paul was, his ability was questioned, his motives were questioned, and Paul was heartbroken over that. What we receive here in 2 Corinthians is a pastor's letter to people he loves saying, here's how I do that. Here's how I can, in the midst of all of the imperfections of my life, in the midst of the, the, the lack that I see in my own experience, here's how I can be effective in serving God right where he's called me. And so, for those of us that serve God, here's how we can do the impossible task. Chapter 3, verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? He's saying, listen, I founded the church. Why would you ask me for a letter of recommendation? I love the little turn he puts on this. You, verse 3, you yourselves, our letter of recommendation, are, is the literal. You yourselves, the letter R. You want to know how I can be effective in ministry? Look around the room, Paul said, and see the lives that have been changed by the power of the gospel. That's what he's saying. Written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, there he's referencing the Ten Commandments, but on tablets of the human heart. Now, now verses 4 through 6 is where he really goes with this idea of what we're called to do. Those who serve, it's an impossible thing to do. Look at verse 4. Such is the confidence we have through Christ toward God, verse 5, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. Stop for a minute. Greatest writer in New Testament times, used by God to clarify the gospel for an entire world, from his pen writes, we are not competent to do the very thing God has called us to do. Some of you may feel the ministry entrusted to me, I cannot do. Or if I talk to the majority of us here today, or a majority of you here today who didn't stand, Some are on the sidelines saying, I will get involved in ministry when I get this part of my life straight, or when I get this skill measured, or when this job changes, or when my children are this age, or when this situation is perfect in my life. Please please hear what Paul writes. In his own life, he said, I don't claim to be competent to do this. 
I will never have my life organized enough to serve Jesus Christ on my own. In fact, he says we have no sufficiency in and of ourselves. Look at the uh, end of verse 5. But our sufficiency is from God. Thank you. We need to hear that. The one who equips us to do the work is God himself. He has made us, and here's an interesting play on words, competent or sufficient. He's made us competent or sufficient to be, love this, don't forget this next word, ministers of the covenant. The word means a servant. It means one who serves a higher or a greater cause. The reason why the work is impossible is because we cannot do what God has called us to do. The reason that we can make it the best work in the world is because God himself does the work. And so that's where he goes next. God has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And what's going to come next in verses 7 through 18 is a very lengthy sort of theological discussion that makes a very important point. In essence, and I've tried to, tried to call it down to this, what he's going to write is that, that serving Jesus Christ, making a difference in the lives of people through the power of Jesus Christ, it's the best work in the world. And the way he makes that point is by way of comparison. He's going to compare something that was pretty good with something that's much, much better. And the comparison he uses is the Old Testament. In, in particular, Moses' ministry and bringing the Ten Commandments and that. And so let's read through this. And, and rather than giving you a long theological discussion that you and I, neither one, would enjoy, I'm going to tell you a story and drive home that point as I read through this. So 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more what will, will what is permanent have glory. And if you're like me on Wednesday of this week, when you read that, you're like, I have no idea what he just said. <laughs> so bleak, dark Wednesday for me was spending hours grinding through that, coming to the end of the day and saying, I can't preach this, I don't even understand it. And uh, Thursday was sort of, let me not think about the message, let it sort of percolate. And then Friday dawned sunny and clear and like, I get it. Here's what he's saying. Think of Moses. Moses, great liberator and lawgiver of Israel. Think about Moses. Led the people out of Egypt through the Red Sea. Think of Moses, manna. And then when they got to the, uh, the, the mountain of Sinai, God himself descended in a storm. And Moses alone was welcome to go up and speak with God face to face. And there God gave him the greatest distillation. Let me clarify that. God gave him the second best idea of what it's like to bring glory to God. What it's like to live a life that's right. What is God like? And Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, is the second best expression of that ever. What's the best? Jesus Christ. And Moses was so impacted by the glory of God his face reflected the glory of God. And the people were like, whoa, that's weird. And I kind of get that. And so Moses would put a veil on his face not to intimidate the people of God with the reflected glory of God. Moses, who faced down Pharaoh and led the people to the verge of the promised land, who, who more is written about him than any other Old Testament character. Moses, the, the great lawgiver of Israel. And listen to what I say. Moses' covenant, the, 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 the Ten Commandments, all the law that God gave Moses, listen, listen, was an abject failure in changing the people of God. All the glory failed. And it didn't fail 
because God didn't keep his promise. In fact, time after time, God kept his promise. It didn't fail because it was the wrong promise. It was absolutely the right promise. It didn't fail because it was something inaccurate. It revealed and it reflected the glory, the righteousness, the majesty of God. It failed because it was written on tablets of stone, not in the heart of God's people. God dwelt in the Old Testament in the glory of a cloud. He dwelt in the tabernacle. He dwelt in the temple. He didn't dwell in the hearts of his people. And God gave them a king. And the king caused trouble. And God gave them a nation. And the nation fought a civil war and broke apart. And God gave them victory over the enemies and the enemies turned around and gave, got victory over Israel. And God said, I'm your God. Turn from the idols. And in the very temple of God, they established idols so that near the end, God said, the promise of staying in the land, you forfeit by disobedience. And one of the saddest scenes in the whole Old Testament in Ezekiel is the glory of God, that, that great glory on the mountain that was in the tabernacle, now in the temple, the glory of God departs and his people are left bereft. And what does God do in the face of his people's failure? He does what so godlike. He gives more promises. Beginning with Isaiah, he says, I am going to send my servant. My servant will bear your sins. I'm going to send my servant and he will be a light for the nations and he will bear the, uh, the sins or the transgressions of many. And then in Jeremiah, even later than Isaiah, as the, literally the nation is crumbling around them, as the enemies are encamped around Jerusalem, God in Jeremiah says, I'm going to do a new thing. That covenant I made with Moses, the one that no one could keep because they're lawbreakers, I'm going to give you a new one. Look at Jeremiah 31. We have it projected for you here. <sighs> Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. What was glorious in the past, but has failed because of the faithlessness of God's people, I'm going to do something new. Uh, how about this? And I will put my law within them. Not on tablets of stone, within them. And I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Look at the rest of this verse. I will forgive their iniquity. Iniquity is the idea of twistedness, of getting off of the path. I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. How does that sound? Better than Ten Commandments. That's the idea. And then Ezekiel, if you have your Bibles open, I know that's a high task for a Sunday morning. Look at Ezekiel, because I want to make sure we read this. It's chapter 36 from 2 Corinthians. Uh, you're going to go back to the left a little ways. You're going to get to this big old book called Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel, God is going to make tremendous promises of something new. He's going to deal with the brokenness of his people who were unable in their own strength to do the very thing God had asked. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36. How, are we there? Are we there? This side, I'm looking at this side. Nobody's answering me, yes? Jen, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, look at verse 23. I can kind of always count on the center section. You guys are like the rock stars. I get it, I understand. And so I knew you were there. All right, uh, um, where did, Ezekiel 36. What verse did I say? Oh, beautiful, love it. Let's do that then. Uh, 23, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. Look at the end of that verse. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. What he's going to do is going to go beyond just a, a ethnic group or one nation. Look at verse 26. What are you going to do, God? I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. Here is the thing that separates more fundamentally than anything else, separates the Old Testament from the New. Here is the defining issue of following Christ. God, whose spirit dwelt in a temple, a tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, take your pick, no longer dwells in buildings, no longer dwells in a temple, no longer separated by a veil. According to the promise of God, what God has done is in the life of every single believer in Jesus Christ, the spirit of God has taken up residence. 
That makes us superior to every single Old Testament saint there ever was. We have privilege, promise, and blessing they never dreamed of having. That's why this is the best work in the world. Look back at it in Ezekiel 36. I will put my spirit within you. And what's going to be the result of that? I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Back in 2 Corinthians. You see, the problem with the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, it's the same word, has nothing to do with God's goodness or his promise keeping. It has everything to do with the basic fact that you and I are lawbreakers on our own. In fact, got to be honest with you here, much as I love her and trust her, my wife is a lawbreaker. I'm just going to say the truth to you because I trust you. And like all lawbreakers, when caught, she makes excuses and blames others. (laughs) So uh, remember when the uh, cell phone law got passed? And you can't use cell phones in the car? Uh, You know that, right? Okay, good. Frank, I mean, these young guys, you know. And so uh, on this particular day, a few months ago, I called her, and because she loves me and wants to hear what I have to say and cares about me, she took the phone call. Why are you laughing? I mean, it's it's true. She loves me. Maybe a little less after this story, but... (laughs) And she answered the phone, and she talked to me, and I just, you know, typical husband, right? Like, honey, when are you going to come home? And... You know, what's for dinner and all those kinds of important questions that husbands ask when you talk deep questions with your wife. And, and I heard her say, oh no, and phone hung up. And I thought, does that mean we're not going to have dinner on time or what? And so, <laughs> and then she got home and we had a conversation. And it went like this. I got a ticket. It's the first one, by the way, she's never had one. She was very proud that she never had a ticket before. And I got a ticket. I said, oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. She said, well, it's your fault. <laughs> well, I didn't get the ticket. What do you mean it's my, hey, come on, ladies, hold on, easy now. <laughs> Guys, help me out here. And it's just like, how's it my fault? Oh, you called me. I said, well, you know, you didn't have to answer. Is that not right? It's right. So there was excuses. By the way, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know that law got passed. Right. How'd that work on that ticket being written? Um, we excuse and we blame. And uh, I, I'm just saying, I've never had a ticket for using my phone. Because I know how to leave it on my knee, you know, below the, the windshield. And <laughs> Here's the problem. The law's on the outside saying, do this or don't do this. But the heart hasn't been changed. What we need is a new heart. What God did in the New Testament is say, I'm not going to change the law. The law is still the right thing. I'm going to change people. And I'm going to give them the ability to do what's right. And that ability is going to come from the Spirit of God dwelling in their hearts. This is why it's the best work in the world. What God has called you and me to do, the impossible, He does through us. And we don't have to, we don't have to feel responsible like we've got to get it done ourselves. So uh, look at chapter 3, verse 12. All that talk of Moses and the veil and what was going wrong in the Old Testament, how God made it right in the New Testament. Since we have such hope, we're very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Verse 14 is interesting. Their minds were hardened. For to this day when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. That's an important thing. Jesus showed up on the scene. John chapter 1 said, We have beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What you and I are called to do mostly is simply bear reflected witness to the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. 
So what Paul is arguing in 2 Corinthians is, hey, let's make it about Jesus Christ. In fact, you don't have to turn there. Let me read to you from John 17. I want us to recognize why this is the best work in the world, why it's worth our effort, why it's worth our frustration, why it's worth being misunderstood to do the, uh, the thing we do to serve God. John 17 is called Jesus' high priestly prayer. It's one of those moments where the curtain is drawn back and you and I are given the opportunity to hear one person of the Trinity speaking, praying, pleading with the other, the Son praying to the Father. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he begins a prayer. It is a prayer that has you and me as its subject. Jesus prays for his followers who through all generations will trust him. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Verse 3 is one of the greatest evangelistic verses of all the scriptures. You want to know what is the gospel about? John 17, 3 answers that question. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's our job. This is why it's the best work in the world. You and I bear witness to the only true God, and we glorify Jesus Christ in doing it. I, verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory uh, that I had with you before the world existed. There, Jesus pleading, knowing he faces the cross the next day, pleading, saying, Father, let me go through the agony of the cross for the glory of being with you once again. And you and I are messengers of that work. So let's, uh, let's go to the third truth about this. This work is impossible. If you're having a hard time serving God, get in line. Everyone who's sincere about it has a hard time. But this is the best work in the world because the glory of Jesus Christ far surpasses the glory of anything else. Listen to me. You grew up in a ritualistic church where those Ten Commandments were on the wall. We need to understand that. We need to understand that the Ten Commandments are not the goal. The Ten Commandments are the result of our life in Jesus Christ. Well, how can I do that? How can I, in my service to Christ, whatever that looks like, how can I do what, Scott, you yourself have just told us is impossible? Chapter 4, verse 1. Paul is going to uh, use four we statements. Uh, we do this, we do this, we do this, we do this. And, and those are things that you and I need to learn from. And so uh, this is how we do the impossible thing. Actually, look at verse 3, verse 12. It's the first we statement. Since we have such a hope... We are very, what's the word? Well, that wasn't. Uh, say that like you mean it. Uh, since we have such hope, we are very, oh. that's a little better. Um, th this is the way to serve the Lord. Knowing we're called to do the impossible, but recognizing the glory of what it is that we represent, the gospel, we make no excuses. We are very bold. We act as though the power is not ours. Do you know why? Because the power is not ours. You hold a baby in our nursery. You set up these chairs this morning, or maybe I know there's another crew, Mike, that will take them down here in a little while. You work in our Awana program. You'll be back late tonight for our children's, our, our, uh, our student ministry. You host a small group, you teach a small group, you clean this building. I, I, there's hundreds of things. I don't even know what gets done. You're turning dials in the back and you're keeping up with my talk today. Be bold in that. Make no apologies for, oh, I'm only doing a little bit. We are doing the best work in the world. Be bold about that. God is, is mitigating. God is he's giving his work through us. And so Paul says, we have that hope, and we're very bold. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God. It's a good word, right? I, I, I can stand in a place and serve God because it's a gift of his mercy to me. 
But you can do it for only the same reason. And so since that's the case, we do not lose heart. Some, it was true in the first service, and maybe some here today in the second service, some of them are going to hear this on the internet down the road. Some pastors are very discouraged. It doesn't make any difference, and, and all I get is conflict, and it seems like God's not doing anything through my work. We do not lose heart. You and I are not the judge of what God's doing through our ministry. It is way too soon, way too short-sighted to try and somehow begin keeping a scorecard on what God's doing. It can be a decade or a lifetime before the fruit that we have planted bears, uh, the, the uh, root that we have planted bears fruit. You who are watching kids in the nursery, I was the one that got kicked out of that when I was a kid. I was the one bounced out of Awana for a fist fight with the elder's kid. And I'm a pastor today and he's not, but he's a pretty good guy anyway. You don't lose heart. Oh, you understand opposition, conflict, misunderstanding, accusation, uh, accusation, trust me, I understand those things. I don't lose heart. I don't lose heart because I try and, you know, go with the power of positive thinking. I don't lose heart because I realize God is the one doing the work. And I've got to be faithful to what that calling is. I don't lose heart. Look at the verse 2. Verse 2 is... Important for every church to understand. Our, our elders need to live by this. This pastor needs to operate this way and every God-blessed church will. We have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. We're not going to deceive anybody into the kingdom. We're not going to trick somebody into following Jesus. In the church, means and ends matter. I have this underlined it. Uh, underlined. We refuse to practice cunning. It could be translated trickery. We're not going there. We're not baiting and switching as a church. And uh, the we don't practice underhanded things is balanced by we don't tamper with God's word. Of course, we'd never do that. I love the next thing, again, it's underlined. It's just a little prepositional phrase, but it's so safe. By the open statement of the truth. I mean, just think of that for a minute. How, how do I do the impossible? By the open statement of the truth. We live in a, a world that there's a lot of change, a lot of opinions, and it can be tempting for us to feel like we've got to shout down every false idea. And you and I will spend all of our time shouting down false ideas. When what we're called to do is give an open statement of the truth. And so that when I have a chance to share the gospel with someone of another faith, I don't argue Catholic or Protestant with them. I don't argue Hindu or Muslim or, or uh, uh, anything like that with them. I'm just going to openly state the truth. Here is what God in Christ has done in my life and what he promises to do in yours too. We can't be too smart by half to try and do God's work with underhanded ways. That doesn't bring God's blessing. In fact, verses three and four answer a question some of you have. If the gospel is so good, if it's the best work in the world, and God does his work through me, why do some of the closest relationships I have not trust him? Why in my family, on my job, in my neighborhood, at my school, are close friends who don't have a relationship with Christ, who don't see anything of the glory of the new covenant? Even if our gospel is hid, is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing, what is it? The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. A word to those of us who have loved ones, maybe close family members who don't know Jesus Christ. How do I relate to them? Pray. 
It's God's work to lift the veil, not yours. Don't argue the veil with them. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I'm talking about this. I've had this experience. You know, and so you talk to them about Christ and what God's done in your life, and they're like, yeah, well, no, I don't care. Or that's just not of interest to me. Or yeah, yeah, Scott, I've had this. Oh yeah, Scott, I know, I understand. It's just, that's not for me. I'm thinking, eternity? How could that not be for you? Veil. How is it that people we love reared in our homes, how is it that the people that have walked into churches like this all their lives can make the most destructive decisions in their life? Choose paths that will leave them with ashes and husks at the end of that road. And as we warn them and plead with them, they ignore it. They're veiled, and so we pray for them. It's God's work to lift the veil. It's our work to light the, uh, shine the light. Secondly, we're patient with them. Maybe the problem is, I've been saved too long. Maybe I need to go move in the world of lost people for a while. And maybe I'll be a little more patient with people who just don't get it. Because for a long time in my life, I didn't get it. I pray for them, I'm patient with them, I'm walking the path with them, so the answer is no, I don't break off the relationship. Unless you're dating someone, then I would encourage you not to date evangelistically, but I'm gonna remain friends. I'm gonna go to the family gathering when I'm the only Christian there. God help us, what a great chance to shine the light. Why would we avoid that? Pray, we're patient, we're compassionate. The word means to feel with. Our loved ones are lost. We need to be grieving over that. We need to be close to them enough to know what there is, that, what their heart breaks over and break that, uh, our hearts break with them. Do not condemn, do not judge. That's God's work. We shine the light. Remember what Romans, Paul wrote in Romans, it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. That's still true today. I pray, I'm patient, I'm compassionate, and then I'm clear. Here's what God has done in my life through believing in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the message. I would urge you not to get drawn into for whom they voted. Red or blue does not matter. They're both losing the country. Don't talk about, I go to this denomination or that denomination or don't go to, or this church did me wrong or this church did me right. Not really fruitful topic of conversation. Be clear. I'm not talking about your confirmation or your baptism or your Sunday school pin. I'm talking about what God in Christ has done. And that's a much better conversation. Pray, be patient, compassionate, clear. We're very bold. We do not lose heart. We refuse to practice cunning. I love the end, verse 5. What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. By the way, that verse, verse 5, is the simplest definition of the gospel throughout the scriptures. Jesus Christ as Lord. That's it. Everything else is up for discussion. That's the heart of the gospel right there. With ourselves as your servants. I love that word. The word literally is slaves, bond servant. This is how you do the impossible. You recognize it's not about me or my comfort. It's about the God I'm serving. And I will make myself willingly a slave because it's the best work in the world. God who said, let the light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's a lot. And that's like, there's more, but I'm, we're gonna wrap it up, okay? Talked about three statements. Let me give you three to-dos. Knowing now what I know, what do I do about this as I serve God? Number one, no one is sufficient in themselves. Stop excusing and start serving. Of course you can't do this on your own. Be hubris to think you could. So now that we've settled that, why again are you not serving? You know where I'm kind of going with that? Okay, enough said. Second, 
The gospel is glorious. The word is used 10 times in this text. The gospel is glorious and powerful. Trust God to honor his word. I think just honestly, we don't have nearly enough confidence in God's power to change the human heart. I think we've forgotten what he did in our hearts. Just trust God to honor his word. It's interesting that Paul used the word glory 10 times as he compares 10 commandments. And all 10 times, this is better. I mean, just, let's go with that, right? Let's go with the gospel. Let's get to Jesus and let other things lie. And uh, it's that powerful. Trust that God will do his work. This takes the pressure off of performance. It says, remember, I'm a servant. I'm a servant. And I'll be good with that title. Third, the simple way is the best way. Don't overthink. Proclaim Jesus. There is going to be a game a little later today. I think we referenced that at the beginning, right? And there'll be uh, ebbs and flows in the action and the energy and the cheers and the jeers. But it's honestly not very complex. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what stadium they're in, what uniforms they wear, or how many camera angles they are. The winner of the game today is going to come down to some very basic things. Who blocks? Who tackles, who passes, and who runs the ball. Don't overthink as you choose to step up and serve Jesus Christ. You proclaim Jesus and let God keep his promise to you. I want to pray for us. Father, first of all, I pray for men and women here who honestly may have veils on their eyes right now. Maybe they grew up in a church that honors ritual and pays lip service to the Ten Commandments, but there was never a clear explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how he is the solution for my sin and for the sins of the world. How he alone of all humankind sent from heaven God in a body fulfilled all of the Ten Commandments, perfectly expressing your will and your righteousness. And still, he died a sinner's death. He did it as a substitute for me and for them. God, that your spirit would take blinders off of their eyes so they simply believe that very basic truth. Jesus Christ as Lord. And veils removed and the glory of the gospel shines in hearts. Father, I pray for others who are very discouraged in the way they've served. That you might strengthen us with your spirit. That we would be content at the title servant. And leave the results with you. God, that you would be pleased. You would be honored as we reflect the glory back to you. God, we plead with you on behalf of our lost loved ones that they would respond in faith. But you can do that, and so we'll just be faithful in shining a light. Hear and answer our prayer, we pray. In the strong name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.